The case of Kelsey Smith went shopping for a gift and vanished without a trace. How often do laws enacted at the state level or the rules and policies of individual companies designed to protect people and make their lives more comfortable and safe end up causing harm rather than good? In today's story, a mobile phone operator refused to provide the location of a missing girl, citing privacy laws. In reality, however, the company was obstructing the investigation, delaying the process. Although, tragically, it was too late to assist the girl, in other cases, timely access to such data could save someone's life. The case of young Kelsey Smith, who was tragically killed just a month after celebrating her 18th birthday, not only shook the United States but also captured the attention of the world, as it was widely reported in international media. The girl was abducted in broad daylight from a crowded location, and her body, bearing signs of violence, was later discovered outside the city. The search for Kelsey took almost a week due to the inability to track her movements through her cell phone signal. This circumstance led to much debate and set a precedent that resulted in a series of amendments and the passage of a law named after the victim. But let's look at Kelsey Smith's story from the beginning and try to understand how she was abducted right outside a shopping center, under the watch of dozens of surveillance cameras, and whether this tragedy could have been avoided. We will also explore the personality of the abductor and criminal, who was considered by all to be a loving husband and caring father. Who is Edwin Hall? We will begin our examination of this difficult case by getting to know the man who caused the terrible tragedy. Edwin Roy Hall, friends knew him as Jack Hall, was born in 1981, April 17th, in the small town of Lee's Summit located almost on the border of the states of Missouri and Kansas. He was the second child in a low-income and extremely disadvantaged family. Edwin's childhood was hard, if not to say harsh. Parents of the boy used in large quantities of hot drinks and illegal substances, not engaged in the upbringing of children and mistreated them. Later, Hall will tell about the fact that at the age of five, he was intimately abused by his uncle, his father's brother, but unequivocally confirm or deny this statement is simply not possible. Many thought that this detail was invented by the perpetrator's lawyer in order to make his client look like a victim of circumstances at the trial and try to mitigate his punishment. But be that as it may, and at the age of six, Edwin found himself in an orphanage after his father was behind bars and his mother was deprived of parental rights. In the following years, the boy changed several foster families, but each time he was abandoned after a while and returned back to the orphanage. This was due to the uncontrolled aggression of the child, as well as his cruelty. From an early age, Hall showed sadistic tendencies towards animals. He liked to torture them and watch the suffering. The boy did not recognize anyone's authority, disobeyed his foster parents, stole and ran away from home. His last foster family returned Edwin to state custody at the age of 15. This was after the teenager attacked his stepsister with a knife. Then the tragedy was avoided and the boy was pitied and not prosecuted. However, a year later, he again came to the attention of the police when he deliberately hit another orphanage pupil, who was much younger than him, on the head with a baseball bat. As an adult, Hall had no record with the police and he seemed to have matured, taken charge, and finally reformed. At the age of 20, he married a girl named Alita, who bore him a son a year and a half later. Edwin got an old Chevrolet truck from the 70s, on which he worked, transporting various goods. His neighbors knew him as a quiet, humble, and friendly guy, as well as a good family man. However, he also had another secret life, which became known only when Hall found himself in the dock for committing serious crimes. Who was the victim? Kelsey Smith. Kelsey Ann Smith was born in 1989 on May 3rd in a place called Overland Park, which ranks as the second most populous city in the state of Kansas. She was the third of five children in the large and very close-knit family of Gregory and Missy Smith. Growing up alongside her older brother Steve and sister Lindsay, as well as her younger siblings Caddy and Zach, she was very close to all of them. The family patriarch, Gregory, Greg Smith, 
was a former military man and a veteran of the United States Navy. He had also served in the police force for over two decades and was now enjoying his well-deserved retirement. Meanwhile, the mother, Missy Smith, had dedicated her life to healthcare, having worked for many years at one of the local hospitals. Despite her professional commitments, she brilliantly managed to balance work with raising her numerous offspring and creating a cozy home environment. From a young age, Kelsey was an extremely active, sociable, and theatrical child. She loved to sing and dance, attended a music school where she learned to play several musical instruments, and eagerly participated in school theater productions and choir performances. In addition to this, she thoroughly enjoyed gymnastics and loved soccer, often attending various sporting events with her father and brothers, and she was a fan of the local team. Young Smith had many friends, possessed a great sense of humor, was talented in numerous areas, and knew how to make a good impression on those around her. She also had a profound love for animals from childhood and dreamed of going to college after high school to pursue a career as a veterinarian. In her senior years of high school, Kelsey took a job in the local orchestra, where she played the clarinet, performing at various city events. This job allowed her to save enough money in just six months to buy her first personal car, a 1987 Buick Regal. Her parents weren't too fond of the fact that her car was older than she was and offered to add some money from the family budget to buy something more recent. However, it was crucial for her to purchase her first vehicle independently with her own money, so she declined their offer. Kelsey's Personal Life it's noteworthy that the Smiths went to great lengths to provide their children with the very best, caring deeply for their education and holistic development. However, they also raised their offspring with a strong sense of discipline. There were clear rules in their home that everyone abided by without exception. For instance, all family members were expected to share their plans and always inform each other if they were going to be out late. Kelsey herself was always punctual, never late and would always tell her parents where she was going and who she was spending time with. To during her senior year, Kelsey entered into a romantic relationship with a young man named John Beersmith. According to Kelsey, it was a deep and mutual love at first sight, the kind you read about in books or see in movies. The couple rang in the new year of 2007 together and from then on were practically inseparable. Smith's partner, a year her senior, appeared to be a serious young man who treated his beloved with the utmost care and respect. Both sets of parents approved of their children's choice and did not stand in the way of their relationship. In May 2007, Kelsey celebrated her 18th birthday. That same month, she graduated from high school and was thrilled to learn that she had been accepted into a prestigious college in Kansas where she intended to study veterinary medicine. The following days were, without exaggeration, some of the happiest in the young woman's life. Unfortunately, they turned out to be her last. Smith, along with her classmates, attended parties celebrating the end of high school. She had a great time, fully enjoying the festive atmosphere as well as romantic dates with her beloved. At this point, she had achieved everything she had wished for, admission into her dream college, a relationship with a worthy young man who was about to propose and it seemed a long, happy life lay ahead of her. The Disappearance from the Mall Parking Lot On June 2nd, 2007, Kelsey and John were preparing to celebrate a significant milestone in their relationship, the six-month anniversary of when they first started dating. John planned to make the day even more memorable by proposing to Kelsey. He had a beautiful engagement ring custom-made for the occasion, reserved a table for two at a restaurant, and the evening was set to be one of the happiest in their lives together. Kelsey was unaware of the upcoming proposal, which was meant to be a surprise. She, too, was looking for a gift to surprise and delight John. That Saturday, she styled her hair, did her makeup, dressed up, and drove her car to a Target Corporation store located just 10 minutes from her home. There was no indication of the tragedy that was about to unfold. Around seven in the evening, she called her mother to say she had found a gift for John, but needed to find the perfect gift bag for it, preferably something with a romantic touch. Missy suggested checking a shopping mall across the street from Target, 
confident that it would have what Kelsey was looking for. Kelsey thanked her mother for the advice and said she would be home soon, where John was supposed to pick her up at 8 o'clock. That was the last time Missy heard her daughter's voice. Kelsey never made it back home. When John arrived at 8 with a large bouquet of flowers, he was shocked and frightened to find that Kelsey was not there. Her parents were equally terrified, as it was completely out of character for her not to answer phone calls or texts. She vanished in broad daylight, in a busy area, and no one noticed her disappearance. Search and Investigation The family patriarch, along with his two eldest children, set out to search for their daughter. Upon finding her car parked at the Oak Park Mall, a sliver of hope emerged that Kelsey might still be inside the mall for some unknown reason. However, after searching through all the floors and stores and inquiring with the salespeople and security guards if anyone had seen the girl, they were convinced she was not there. Returning to the car, which appeared undisturbed without any signs of struggle or violence, the father, leveraging his experience as a former police officer, decided not to touch anything. It was possible the car was part of a crime scene, and it was crucial not to tamper with or destroy any evidence. The girl's parents reported her missing to the police that same day, but were initially met with resistance to start an immediate search. The explanation was that since Kelsey was 18, she wouldn't legally be considered missing until 24 hours had passed since her disappearance. However, Kelsey's father, not one to back down and using his old connections, insisted on an immediate search for his daughter. Moreover, he made inquiries to see if any hospitals in the city had admitted women matching their daughter's description. Kelsey's family and fiancé were interviewed that same evening to establish their alibis and rule them out as suspects, a standard procedure. Surveillance footage from the Target store was also reviewed. The videos showed Kelsey entering the store, browsing the selection, making a purchase, and then, while talking on the phone, leaving the building to head back to her car. At that moment, she was speaking with her mother, asking where to find a gift bag, and then headed to the mall across the street, following her mother's advice. Essentially, Kelsey simply drove out, turned around, and parked at the Oak Park Mall, leaving her car near the side entrance almost against the wall. Her car was thoroughly inspected by experts. It seemed untouched from the outside. The gift she bought for John was on the passenger seat, and her backpack with personal items, a tablet, and a wallet containing about $300 in cash was in the back. Therefore, a robbery was quickly ruled out. It appeared that the car's owner had left only with her credit card and phone in her pocket, as everything else remained inside the car. No signs of a struggle, blood, or damage were found. There were no foreign fingerprints except for one found on the driver's seatbelt. This fingerprint belonged to neither Kelsey, her relatives, nor her boyfriend. Issues with the cellular company tracking the young woman's location could have been possible through the signal of her mobile phone. By that time, the device itself had become inaccessible, presumably turned off or damaged, but it was still feasible to determine the last known location where the mobile phone was active in order to narrow down the search area. However, Verizon Communications, the wireless carrier, did not provide the necessary data for the investigation for several days. Interestingly, the company did not outright refuse to cooperate, but kept promising to look into the matter, effectively dragging out the process. Back in 2007, telecommunications companies were allowed to withhold subscriber data from law enforcement agencies, including the police or FBI, without a specific court order. They cited information privacy laws and even situations where an individual's safety or life might be at risk were not considered exceptions to this rule. The Disturbing Stranger Upon closer examination of the surveillance footage, a chilling detail was uncovered, a mysterious stranger following the young woman like a shadow. He didn't stand out at first because he always kept his distance and didn't attempt to interact with Kelsey directly. The individual in question was a Caucasian male with a pleasant appearance estimated to be in his early to mid-twenties, sporting dark, short hair, and a light beard. He was dressed casually in a plain white t-shirt and black shorts. 
He entered the Target store roughly half a minute after the girl and followed her through all the sections she visited, maintaining a few meters distance. This mysterious man was captured by all the surveillance cameras that Kelsey was, and later during the trial, the prosecution would describe his behavior as akin to a predator stalking its prey. He exited the store after her and making sure she was alone, followed her to the Oak Park parking lot in his Chevrolet truck. It's likely that he overheard her conversation with her mother as he was practically behind Kelsey while she was on the phone. Consequently, he could have learned about her plans to visit the neighboring shopping center. Unfortunately, Smith parked her car in a poorly chosen spot next to a side door near a storage area where shadows fell on her vehicle, making it nearly impossible to discern the events on the camera footage. While Kelsey was still seated in her car, the truck parked beside her, and a figure in a white t-shirt and black shorts emerged. The stranger approached her from the driver's side door, and then she, presumably under the threat of harm, got behind the wheel of his Chevrolet, and the truck drove off in an unknown direction. Media Attention and Alert Viewers From the outset, largely thanks to the connections and experience of Gregory Smith, the media were enlisted to cover the investigation. Smith knew that the louder the outcry, the broader the coverage in the press, and the more attention it garnered, the higher the chances of finding their daughter and bringing the responsible party to justice. The story was covered not only in national, but also in international media, including on the popular show, America's Most Wanted. When surveillance footage revealed the mysterious stranger following Kelsey, the frames showing his face most clearly were broadcasted in the news, urging people to come forward if they recognized the man. That same evening, the police began receiving calls from individuals claiming to have seen the man in various cities and even states. Although most of these reports were mistaken, each one was investigated. On June 6th, a Mrs. Miguez called in, stating she recognized her neighbor Edwin Hall in the footage but had hesitated to report it initially due to doubt. However, seeing the information about the truck removed her last doubts, as Hall also drove an old 1970s Chevrolet. Horrific discovery at Longview Lake and suspects arrest. On June 6, 2007, several pivotal events unfolded in the investigation. First, crucial data regarding the last known location of Kelsey's phone signal was finally obtained from Verizon Communications. A specific cell tower was pinpointed, establishing a search radius of 1.1 miles to the north of it. Within 45 minutes of initiating the search operation, the lifeless body of the young woman was found in the brush near Longview Lake, Missouri, approximately 30 miles from where she was abducted. The medical examiners determined that Kelsey had been brutally assaulted and then strangled with her own belt. Her body was discovered without clothing, except for the belt used to strangle her around her neck. After the assault, her body was callously discarded in the bushes covered only slightly with dry branches. Over the four days it lay exposed under the June sun, her remains were severely disfigured by insects and other wildlife, making them almost unrecognizable. Nonetheless, the examination confirmed that it was indeed the missing young Smith. The second significant event on June 6th was the arrest of the main suspect. When the police arrived at the man's residence, he was completely calm, acknowledged that his friends called him Jack, and agreed to provide a statement at the station. During the interrogation, he identified himself as Edwin Hall. Presented with a photograph of Kelsey, he claimed never to have seen her before. Even when shown surveillance footage from the store showing him following her closely, he insisted he had merely visited Target for personal reasons and hadn't noticed her, suggesting their appearance together in the footage was merely a bizarre coincidence. Irrefutable evidence. Edwin was evidently confident that he had left no trace behind and could not be held accountable. His van was clean. He had assaulted the victim using contraception, leaving no DNA evidence. Therefore, Hall agreed to cooperate with the investigation and even volunteered to provide his DNA sample and fingerprints. Crucially, his thumbprint matched the one found on the victim's car's seatbelt buckle, becoming a pivotal piece of evidence. Furthermore, during a thorough search of the suspect's home, a hidden air pistol was found with Kelsey's DNA traces on the barrel. 
Hall was then officially charged with the abduction, assault, and termination of the young woman's life. Since Smith was abducted in Kansas, but her lifeless body was discovered in Missouri, there arose a question regarding the jurisdiction of the trial. This detail was significantly important as it affected the potential sentence. In Missouri, the perpetrator faced the possibility of capital punishment. Trial and sentence Hall, realizing the gravity of his situation and after consulting with his attorney, decided to fully admit his guilt and disclose the details and circumstances of the crime in hopes of receiving a lesser sentence. He recounted how he noticed Kelsey as she entered the store and followed her. Indeed, he was close enough to overhear her phone conversation, learning she planned to visit the shopping center across the street. Edwin made sure Smith was alone, followed her to the adjacent parking lot, and was pleased when she parked in a secluded spot near the side entrance. He then emerged from his vehicle, armed with a pistol, waited for the victim to return to her car, and prevented her from closing the door as she was getting into the driver's seat. Apparently, she had already pulled out the seatbelt, but he didn't allow her to buckle up, leaving his print on it in the process. Next, he placed the pistol barrel in the unfortunate girl's mouth, coercing her to move to his vehicle's driver's seat under threat. Smith drove Hall's truck while he aimed the weapon at her and instructed where to go. Upon reaching a remote area at the state border, he ordered her out of the truck and led her into the bushes. There, he assaulted her, strangled her with the belt, and covered her body with branches. He meticulously cleaned his truck's cabin to remove any fingerprints, DNA, or other traces of the victim's presence, and hid the pistol with Kelsey's saliva at his home, confident it would never be found. When asked about his motive, he couldn't provide a clear explanation, but indifferently commented on her fantastic legs. Additionally, during the investigation, several other women and girls victimized by Hall's actions came forward. It was revealed that he had coerced a 14-year-old neighbor into intimacy with threats, harassed a local waitress, and fled a restaurant without paying. As a result, charges of corruption of a minor, harassment, and theft were added to the existing accusations. Hall's lawyer attempted to appeal to the court's sympathy, highlighting his client's troubled childhood, past victimhood, lack of parental care, and upbringing in foster homes. The defense's efforts were in vain, but the lawyer was the only person to speak on the defendant's behalf and support him. Hall's wife was present at all court hearings, but sat quietly in a corner, refusing to defend her husband. On September 16, 2008, Johnson County's judge sentenced Edwin Roy Hall to 27 life sentences without the possibility of parole. After hearing the verdict, the defendant apologized to the Smith family for his actions and then broke down in tears. He is currently serving his sentence at the Hutchinson Correctional Facility in Kansas. The Kelsey Smith Act. The role of Verizon Communications in this case, which hesitated for four days to provide data regarding the last known location of the missing girl's phone signal, drew significant attention. The company's leadership cited privacy laws and the absence of a court order, the issuance of which would take time. Although it was later determined that this information wouldn't have saved young Smith, in other situations, it could help preserve the lives and health of individuals in danger. This led to the enactment of the Kelsey Smith Act by Kansas in 2009, mandating telecommunications companies to provide subscriber location information when there is a risk of death or serious physical harm to the individual. An additional 29 states, including Missouri by 2012, adopted similar legislation. In 2021, Oklahoma, Montana, and Illinois also passed the Kelsey Smith Act. Since its enactment, this law has helped save many lives. For instance, in 2015 in Lemexa, Kansas, when a perpetrator stole a car with a child in a car seat, the police were able to locate him within half an hour by tracking the signal from the mobile phone left on the back seat by the child's mother. In 2021 in Illinois, a similar method was used to find a young woman who attempted to end her life by jumping off a cliff. She survived, albeit with significant injuries, but the prompt tracking of her phone signal led to her rescue. Interestingly, the Smith family never requested the law to be named after their deceased daughter. 
The idea came from Kansas Senator Rob Olson. Following their tragedy, the girl's family established a foundation to assist crime victims and continues to raise awareness among young people about safety issues. Law enforcement officers are tasked with protecting the legal rights and interests of the citizens of their country, ensuring public order safety, and identifying and stopping any violations. Theoretically, the charter and principles of law enforcement operations sound flawless, but in real life, there are cases that literally make your blood run cold when people who are meant to serve and protect violate the law themselves or cover up for those who do. Such wrongful actions often lead to real criminal schemes, resulting in severe consequences. The case of Valeria Vivanco, a police officer who died in the line of duty, gained widespread resonance not only in Chile, where the tragic events unfolded, but also in the media of other countries. Essentially, the young woman's life was ended by a colleague who was supposed to protect her and ensure her safety. The most horrifying aspect was that the higher authorities knew about this and attempted to distort the facts, accusing another person of the incident and hiding the real circumstances of the event. Although the actual culprit of the tragedy was identified and even sentenced to a real prison term, the motive behind his actions remains unclear, whether it was a tragic accident or if it was deliberate. Moreover, it's puzzling why he was covered and defended by high-ranking individuals for so long. Even after it seemed the guilty party had faced punishment, the Supreme Court, upon reviewing an appeal, shocked the victim's family with its unexpected decision. Who was Valeria Vivanco? Valeria Fernanda Vivanco was born on May 29, 1996, in the small commune of La Granja, located near the city of Santiago, the capital of Chile, and was the youngest of three children in the simple family of Miguel and Jacqueline Vivanco. She was raised alongside her older biological brother Michelangelo and sister Daniela. The family patriarch worked for a company involved in the transportation of passengers and goods while her mother was a homemaker dedicated to raising her children and creating a cozy home environment. When Valeria started school, her parents decided to separate. This was a huge shock for the girl, and although the ex-spouses continued to communicate post-divorce, and the father remained actively involved in the lives of his children from his first marriage, including providing financial support. The youngest daughter harbored resentment towards him. They occasionally argued, sometimes not speaking for months, but they always reconciled. Miguel Vivanco remarried soon after, and Valeria gained two more half-siblings with whom she, as well as Daniela and Michelangelo, maintained warm family relations. Jacqueline never remarried, raised her children, and later took care of her grandchildren, gifted to her by her older offspring. From an early age, Valeria demonstrated a strong-willed character, determination, and incredible perseverance in all her endeavors. She excelled in school, engaged in sports, was courageous and just, and was always ready to help others, sometimes even at risk to herself. It was likely this desire to assist those around her, protect the vulnerable, and stand up for justice that led her to pursue a career in the police force. After successfully completing high school, Valeria enrolled in the police academy in Santiago. She graduated with honors, becoming an investigator, and having received her diploma in 2016 at the age of 20, joined the Chilean police force the following year. She began her service in the bureau investigating especially serious crimes located in the capital. From the first days of her service, Young Valeria proved herself to be a dedicated law enforcement officer and a true fighter for justice. She loved her job, performed her duties diligently, and was ready to rush anywhere at any time if required by her service. She could leave in the middle of the night to respond to a crime scene, chased after criminals, risking herself, and sometimes had to act as a psychologist when interacting with people who had lost loved ones. Colleagues described Vivanco as kind, cheerful and friendly, yet she was a true professional and a reliable partner. She served in the police force for almost five and a half years, during which she received a vast number of accolades, awards, and actively advanced in her career, 
earning the respect of her colleagues and the admiration of the leadership. Additionally, she represented her department in Spain, spending about two weeks in Madrid on an official visit. She was immensely proud to be entrusted with such responsible missions. By 2020, she had been promoted to assistant inspector, the new young colleague. In January 2020, a new member was welcomed to the precinct where Valeria worked, 21-year-old Lionel Alejandro Contreras Canales. Fresh out of the police academy, Valeria effectively became his mentor at his first job. A few months later, they became partners and initially got along pretty well. Little is known about Lionel's early years. Some information suggests he came from a rather influential and affluent family, but a high-ranking official as his uncle. Growing up in comfort, never wanting for anything, Lionel was quite self-centered, believing everything should go his way. Valeria quickly caught the eye of her new colleague and partner as he made various attempts to show her attention, tried to court her, and even asked her out a few times, but was met with firm rejection each time. Valeria took her job very seriously, considered workplace romances inappropriate, and was quite strict with the young co-worker seeing him as immature. The issue wasn't so much the age difference, Lionel was only three years younger, as it was his behavior, which Valeria found childish but hoped to help him mature. In July 2020, Valeria and her young partner were involved in apprehending robbers who had stolen money from a store's cash register. The criminals, not having left the scene and armed, initiated a shootout, during which both were fatally engaged by Lionel. Although casualties could have been avoided, Lionel's actions were not deemed excessive for apprehending the individuals. However, this incident strained the relationship between the partners. The Last Birthday On May 29, 2021, Valeria celebrated her 25th birthday. The celebration took place at her mother's house, attended by many guests including relatives, friends, and work colleagues. Lionel, however, was not among the invited. Valeria, aiming to avoid potential awkwardness, chose not to invite her young partner, who had recently attempted to court her again. Valeria tried to talk to him about this, but he only repeated his affections for her, which she did not want other colleagues to find out about. Despite the large turnout, gifts, heartfelt congratulations, and warm wishes, the birthday girl seemed upset, though she tried to smile. The reason was a recent argument with her father, leading to days without communication. Valeria hoped her father would attend her birthday, allowing them to reconcile, but the likely angered parent only sent a terse congratulatory message, not even calling. Jacqueline noticed her daughter's distress and knew the reason behind her hidden sadness. Angry at her ex-husband's actions, she believed Miguel would eventually call Valeria, talk things out, and reconcile as they always had before. Unfortunately, the father and daughter never got the chance to talk again, as two weeks later, Valeria tragically lost her life while on duty. The Fatal Shot On June 13, 2021, Valeria was on night duty, participating in street patrols and vehicle checks. This was not a standard procedure, but a search for suspects related to the crime against a young woman that had occurred the previous day in a suburb of the capital. There was an alert for a white Kia Torado, believed to be driven by a suspected criminal. The suspect likely had a weapon and might not have been alone in the car. Valeria was in a patrol car with her partner Lionel, driven by Deputy Commissioner Felipe Gilliardo Araya. They spotted the suspect's vehicle and initiated a pursuit without waiting for backup. The officers managed to intercept and block the suspect's escape. Penales and Vivanco exited their vehicle, weapons drawn, and called for the offenders to surrender and exit their car with their hands up. At that moment, a single shot rang out, and as everyone tried to understand who fired and where, Valeria, clutching her side, fell to the asphalt next to the police car. Reinforcements arrived just then, so her colleagues heard the shot and saw that she was wounded, but couldn't fully grasp what had happened and who had fired. The criminals, seizing the moment of confusion, 
accelerated and fled the scene while the injured officer was being administered first aid. Despite the rapid arrival of medics and her colleagues' efforts to stem the bleeding, Valeria could not be saved. She was rushed to the nearest hospital, where top specialists fought for her life for several hours. However, due to severe blood loss and damage to vital organs, she passed away on the operating table without regaining consciousness. When her family was informed, her parents, brothers, and sisters immediately rushed to the hospital. But by then, the wounded officer had already died. Miguel was not just stricken with grief, but utterly devastated, as he had not had the chance to speak and reconcile with his beloved daughter, with whom he had had a petty argument last. He felt a profound sense of guilt toward her, so shaken by the event that he himself required medical attention to prevent a heart attack. The Search and Arrest of the Suspects According to the official version, Vivanco died in the line of duty during an operation to catch dangerous criminals. She was hailed as a hero who gave her life for the peace and safety of others. This incident was widely covered in local media, with reporters vividly describing the young officer's heroism and self-sacrifice. The investigation was handled by specialists from the Homicide and Major Crimes Division, where Valeria herself had worked. They concluded that she died from a shot to the abdomen, fired by someone facing her from the direction of the suspect's vehicle she was pursuing with her colleagues. Everything seemed logical, with witnesses corroborating the story, making it appear that the case was solved and all that remained was to find and punish the culprits who were still at large and possibly on the run. Soon after, the suspects were apprehended, generating widespread public attention. The criminals turned out to be 19-year-old Miguel Alejandro Canupan and his 17-year-old accomplice, whose name was withheld due to his minor status, both previously convicted for minor offenses. The then-president of Chile, Miguel Juan Sebastián Piñera Echenique, issued an official statement promising that the perpetrators would be brought to justice with all the rigor of the law. Something doesn't add up. After the autopsy and all necessary examinations were conducted, the body of the deceased Vivanco was handed over to her family and was buried with honors at one of the capital cemeteries. Hundreds of people came to pay their last respects, expressing their sincere condolences to the girl's family. According to Jacqueline and Miguel, the entire ordeal seemed like a horrific dream, and they hardly remembered the events of the funeral day. Among the men carrying Valeria's coffin was her colleague Lionel, who appeared to mourn her more than anyone else. However, according to other colleagues, there had been some tension between the partners lately, to the extent that the girl didn't even invite the young man to her birthday celebration. Almost immediately after the funeral, court proceedings began regarding the suspects who were apprehended the day after the incident and were in custody. At that moment, Everyone was confident that the culprits were caught, and proving their guilt seemed straightforward, especially since they began to give confessional testimonies. However, it soon became clear that the investigation had been flawed from the start, with critical details overlooked and key findings from forensic experts downplayed. The process was mishandled, and high-ranking officials tried to conceal the identity of the true culprit behind the girl's demise. Thus, about a month and a half after the officer's death, the case took an unexpected turn. By the end of July, two employees were suspended from their duties, allegedly involved in the incident leading to Valeria's death. On August 1st, the deceased girl's parents were called to the Capitol's prosecutor's office for a meeting on an important matter. The parents thought that new evidence had emerged in their daughter's case and that the detainees, awaiting their final sentence, would finally receive deserved punishment. However, the grief-stricken Jacqueline and Miguel were shocked to learn that their daughter died from a bullet fired by her colleague. This was personally communicated to them by Prosecutor Juan Carlos Carrasco, who also conveyed his condolences and apologies on behalf of the entire investigative department. Valeria's parents were bewildered. They couldn't believe their ears and couldn't understand how such a thing could happen. 
They relived their grief anew and wanted clarification on the situation and why this information only became known so much later. As it turned out, that single fatal shot came from the service weapon in the hands of one of the girl's colleagues. This was confirmed by a ballistics examination conducted that same day, but its results were somehow distorted and the bullet extracted from the body was sent to the evidence locker with entirely different characteristics, shape, caliber, weight, etc. Furthermore, the bullet had exited through and through and it was not extracted from the body. The entry and exit wounds in the forensic reports were accidentally or intentionally confused. That is, the bullet did not enter through the abdomen and exit through the back, but quite the opposite. The shot was fired at her back. Some pages from the autopsy report were missing, while others were clearly altered and replaced. Additionally, the detainees, over whom the trial was proceeding and who supposedly confessed to their guilt and were about to be imprisoned, started filing complaints. They claimed that their confessions were coerced through torture and threats, and the pistol they had on them that evening wasn't even loaded. Moreover, their involvement in the earlier crime, which prompted the interception plan that fateful night, was also unconfirmed. New Suspects In a twist, Vivanco went from being seen as a tragic hero who died in the line of duty to a victim of betrayal, killed by her own colleagues. Given the new circumstances, the primary suspects became Philippe Giliardo Araya, who was driving the police car, and Valeria's partner, Lionel Alejandro Contreras Canales, who was seated in the back. Both suspects were immediately suspended from duty. Thus, on August 5th, it became known that the bullet that killed Valeria was fired from a service weapon. Subsequently, a document emerged with the results of the examination, indicating that only Camales had dunshot residue on his hands, making him the prime suspect. Notably, this finding had not been mentioned anywhere before, as if it never existed. Several other reports concerning the ballistics examination and the pathologist's conclusions were improperly filed and ended up in an archive box, which was never adequately checked. Whether this was an accident, criminal negligence, or intentional concealment of crucial facts was yet to be determined. Now the police officers who participated in the operation to apprehend the criminals themselves became suspects in the murder of their colleague. They, along with the previously arrested perpetrators, took part in a reenactment of the events of that night. Philippe claimed that from the driver's seat he could only see Valeria who was seated next to him in the front passenger seat and was the first to exit the car. Lionel was sitting behind and also exited the vehicle, but his actions could not be seen by the driver. Valeria had only taken a few steps when a shot was fired. She fell, and the suspect's car they were chasing sped away. Lionel then rushed to the injured woman to provide first aid. Lionel claimed that he and his partner exited the patrol car almost simultaneously, but she immediately rushed forward when the shot was fired. He insisted that he did not shoot his colleague, and the driver should have seen and confirmed this. He also confirmed that he was the first to rush to Valeria's aid and tried to compress her wound. Despite differences in the direct participants' testimonies, the reconstruction showed that Canales was behind his partner at the moment of the shot and the bullet's trajectory matched his location. He was also the only person found with gunshot residue on his hands. Possible Motives for the Crime After previously hidden reports and examination results were released, Lionel was taken into custody as the primary suspect. While the young men previously detained were released under a non-exit agreement, as there was effectively nothing to charge them with. However, the motive behind the young officer's actions remained unclear. The first and main theory was that the entire incident was a tragic accident. Supposedly, the young and inexperienced officer discharged his weapon unintentionally while standing behind his partner. He panicked, tried to help her, and when turning in his service weapon that day, insisted he hadn't fired it. However, the truth quickly surfaced, and influential relatives of the young man using all their power, money, and connections, attempted to suppress the incident. Hence, the cleaned reports, missing documents, confusion in the evidence, 
and coerced testimonies from the detained. Another theory, partially confirmed by Lionel himself, was that he was unrequitedly in love with Valeria and desperately sought her attention, but all his efforts were in vain. Over time, he began to merely irritate the girl, who didn't even invite him to her birthday party attended by the entire department. The shot in the back was his revenge for the rejection. A third theory, proposed by the deceased's relatives, suggested that Valeria discovered something she wasn't supposed to know, some corruption scheme, official crimes, or something similar. As an honest and fair person, she would undoubtedly have exposed the culprits, which is why she was eliminated and young Lionel was chosen as the executor, promised that he would remain above suspicion. The second suspect. Despite Canales being taken into custody, suspicions about Philippe were not entirely dispelled. He was armed with identical service weapons, also stood behind the deceased colleague, and could have fired the shot. Moreover, he had previously been disciplined for the unjustified use of a weapon during a criminal arrest, though no one was harmed in that instance. Araya had since been nicknamed the Reckless Shooter. The defense team hired by the relatives to defend Lionel immediately seized this theory, insisting that Philippe accidentally shot the colleague, and since the service weapons were identical, the pistols could have been mixed up or intentionally swapped. Additionally, the man was inconsistent in his testimony, changing it several times, and later he claimed he could not accurately describe the events of that night as everything happened very quickly. However, no gunpowder residue was found on the driver's hands, indicating his innocence. In response, Kamalis claimed that gunpowder got on his hands when he was compressing the wound on the victim's body, and Araya, who also helped the woman, might have washed his hands before the examination. Yet this statement was not credible, as Valeria's bloodstains remained on Philippe's hands, and it's impossible to wash off gunpowder without removing blood. The Trial and Verdict the quality of the investigative team's work was once again questioned, and the deceased girl's parents despaired, unsure how to achieve justice. Furthermore, the new turn in the case caused public outrage and led to mistrust in the law enforcement agencies. This story was now covered not only by Chilean but also international media. As a result, many high-ranking officials were suspended from work and soon lost their positions particularly the head of the Homicide Investigation Department. After additional investigation, Lionel remained the only suspect, with all others excluded from the list and classified as witnesses. In the spring of 2022, he was officially dismissed and remained in custody until the trial's conclusion. The hearings for this case only began in March of the following year, and based on the evidence and witness testimony, the suspect's guilt was fully proven. Initially, the prosecution accused Kamalas of intentionally murdering his partner and sought the maximum sentence for such cases. However, the accused insisted he would never harm Valeria as he loved her. Nonetheless, it was from his pistol that the bullet was fired, ending the girl's life. Lionel was found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to 12 years in prison, with the possibility of parole after eight years. Following the announcement of the final verdict, the Vivanco family expressed their disagreement, considering the sentence too lenient, while the defendant and his legal team immediately filed a series of appeals. However, the real shock came to Valeria's relatives in February 2024, when the Supreme Court unexpectedly overturned the previously assigned punishment, sentencing the perpetrator to only 540 days of imprisonment, counted from the day of his arrest. Effectively, he walked free from the courtroom. The detective Valeria Vivanco's family, in light of this event, plans to sue the Chilean state, accusing the judges of corruption. In an official statement, the deceased girl's mother said, The 12-year sentence already seemed too lenient to us, but this is just mockery. I feel as if my daughter has died all over again. I no longer believe in justice. Our family plans to sue the negligent Chilean state as that's exactly what it deserves. The tragic story of the Rose family is considered one of the most bizarre and confusing crimes committed in America in recent years. 
This case struck investigators not only by its cynicism and cruelty, but also by the fact that the victims and the alleged perpetrators were close relatives. Despite the fact that many years have passed since the crime was committed, and the perpetrator has long served his harsh sentence behind bars, there are still many questions and white spots in this story. Many still do not believe in the fairness of the court's verdict. Now let's get down to business. It was an ordinary average family living in a provincial suburb of Bristol in the state of Tennessee and had never been on the radar of law enforcers before. The family was headed by elderly couple Curtis and Lena Maria Rose, who had lived together for over 40 years. They had two grown daughters and six grandchildren, but we will only look at those family members who were directly involved in this high-profile case. So, at the time of the crime in the house and the surrounding area, were the elderly owners themselves, Curtis and Lena Maria Rose, their eldest daughter, 39-year-old Tosha Milhorn with her husband James and six children. Two of the children were Tosha and James's shared children, while the other three children were their heirs from a previous relationship. Also present in the house was a neighborhood girl who stopped by to play with them. It is worth noting that Tosha and James and their children lived at Tosha's parents' house for about two months, as their own home was undergoing renovations at the time. Later, another key player in those events, 19-year-old Seth Denton, arrived at the house. He was Toshi's eldest son, but his relationship with his mother and stepfather was strained, to put it mildly, and they avoided communicating with each other in every possible way, and their last meeting ended in tragedy. According to neighbors, the Rose couple was quite happy and prosperous, their daughter Tosha was also happily married to James, who worked as an auto mechanic and was fond of restoring vintage cars. It was the Rose couple's family home that was the scene of the carnage. Police officers who arrived on the call later dubbed it the worst crime scene they had ever seen and the bloodiest in the history of their quiet county. The bodies of two women, Lena Maria and Tosha, a mother and daughter, were found in the house, shot almost point blank. Tosha was in a chair at the dining room table, and her mother was lying on the floor between the table and the refrigerator. Also lying on the doorstep of the house was the critically wounded James, Tosha's husband, who was quickly rushed to the hospital. But despite the efforts of the doctors, the man soon died of extensive internal injuries and massive blood loss. None of the children in the house were injured. It is likely that they were not targeted by the shooter, or were simply not in his field of vision at the time of the massacre of the adults. Almost immediately after the crime, the police received two phone calls, one after the other. The first call came from the owner of the house, Curtis Rose, who said that his eldest grandson, Seth, had committed a shooting in the house and then fled the scene. But soon there was a call from Seth himself, who told a different version of what happened and blamed everything on his grandfather, Curtis. In addition, it turned out that Seth was wounded in the arm and shot him Curtis. However, he did not deny it, saying that he was trying to detain his grandson and not let him escape from the scene of the massacre. The alleged killer, Seth Denton, was arrested in the hospital, where he sought medical help in connection with the wound. Then the investigation was to restore the chain of tragic events and find out what really happened in the house of the Rose family. Surprisingly, but for the basis of the investigation was taken only one version, and the second version was taken seriously only a few years later. She naively believed that this would happen again, and loved ones and colleagues did not even guess that her spouse raised his hand on her. However, a year later, the story repeated itself, and Adrian again beat his wife. This time, Samantha decided that it was the last straw. In addition, her husband's constant temper tantrums and his manic desire to control her every move were driving Samantha crazy. She wrote a statement to the police, reporting that she was beaten by her husband, then took the children and moved to the house of her parents. In the spring of 2017, the spouses officially divorced and their family home by court order got Samantha and the children, and soon they returned there. However, Adrian did not plan to leave his ex-wife alone at all and continued to pursue her, poisoning her life. The young woman did not feel safe and was in constant fear. Fearing for her own life, 
and the lives of her children. She obtained a court injunction to prevent her ex-husband from approaching them and trying to interfere in any way in their affairs. But this did not stop Basham. He settled nearby, trying in every way to annoy Samantha. According to a friend of Edrin, he promised to take away from his ex-wife everything that is dear to her, starting from the house and ending with children, as well as openly threatened physical violence against her. Shortly before the tragedy, the man again told his friend that Samantha would soon pay for everything. At the same time, he looked threatening, but the friend did not take these words seriously until he learned of the woman's death. Living in constant fear and nervous tension, Samantha equipped her home with an alarm system, installed bars on her windows, and placed surveillance cameras outside her home. She admitted that she was afraid that her ex-husband might break into her home and harm her or the children in some way. About a year after the divorce, Samantha began to feel that her ex-husband had calmed down and cooled down a bit. He became less frequent in her sight, which gave her the illusion of safety. Samantha even began to have an affair and began to make plans for a new happy life. On July 22, 2018, Fraser celebrated her 38th birthday in the company of close friends and a beloved man named Wayne. According to the memories of those who shared this holiday with her, she looked happy and was quite calm for herself and her loved ones. A few days before, the new chosen one had proposed to the woman, and after the wedding, they planned to take a long vacation and travel to distract themselves and forget about problems. The next morning, Samantha took the children to school and was on her way to work when she received a phone call from someone she knew, warning her that Adrian was in the neighborhood of her home. Samantha was concerned about this, but decided not to panic, just to be more cautious. She was due to face her ex-husband in court in a domestic violence case in a couple weeks, and she feared that he might somehow retaliate against her for the lawsuit. The woman shared her worries with her best friend in a phone conversation, but the latter reassured her. After that conversation, Samantha was never seen alive again. When Samantha did not come to school that day to pick up her children, the teacher, who knew about the difficult situation in their family, decided to call the police. The law enforcers immediately went to their home to check everything, and at first the situation looked as if the mistress had not yet returned. But when the officers of the law decided to check the garage adjacent to the house, before them opened a terrible picture. The body of the 38-year-old homeowner was hanging from the garage door fixture, and on the whole, the picture might have looked like the young woman had taken her own life. But Samantha's appearance was as if she had been run over by a truck. There was literally not a living spot on Samantha, and the hair on her head was wet and falling over her face, covering it. She wasn't wearing the same clothes she had left the house in that morning, and her shoes were missing altogether. It was obvious that someone else had been in the garage, and that someone had tried to make it look like Samantha had voluntarily passed away, but had made a lot of mistakes. For example, there was an overturned stepladder lying next to the body, but the rope was so long that the woman's feet were touching the floor. With age, this feeling turned into hatred, about which Seth often told friends and relatives. After graduating from school, the guy decided to go to serve in the army, and a year later, returning home, he again settled at his grandparents. However, soon the young man decided that he wanted to start an independent life and moved to the city where he rented a small apartment with his friend. He got a job at one of the local fast food restaurants, but shortly before the tragedy, the guy was fired. Family and friends spoke positively about Seth, noting that he never had any violent tendencies, did not run with bad companies, and never broke the law. But despite the positive characteristics, detectives considered that the main motive of the crime was Seth's unpleasant feelings towards his mother and her current spouse. According to the investigation, the events of that day developed as follows. Around 5 p.m., Seth drove his car to the house of his grandparents. He was wearing a camouflage jacket, and in the car lay a semi-automatic rifle. He left the car by the roadside, and with the weapon in hand, he went to the house, entering through the back door. Seth then fired several shots, killing his mother, grandmother, and severely wounding his stepfather, before leaving the jacket and rifle by the back door and going to his grandfather's house and asking him to call the police. The order in which the shots were fired was never determined, 
because Seth completely denied his guilt. In addition, it was unclear why he asked his grandfather to call the police rather than fleeing immediately from the scene of the crime. It is assumed that his main target were his mother and stepfather, and the guy killed his grandmother as an unnecessary witness. As the main evidence proving Seth's guilt, the case included his jacket and rifle, found on the threshold at the back door of the house, traces of blood on his shoes, as well as bullets found in his car. Remarkably, about a hundred rounds of ammunition in total were found, but no one questioned why he needed so many if he only planned to kill two people. Another oddity was the timing. According to the grandfather, after he and his grandson entered the house, where the terrible picture opened before his eyes, Seth hurriedly left the scene. Curtis himself found and took the children to safety, called the police, pulled out the gun he kept, and after all this, managed to catch up with his grandson and shot him twice. It was not until 2016 that the young man presented his version of what happened in court, which no one had previously considered for some reason. According to Seth, he has always been very close to his grandparents who raised him, but meetings with his mother he avoided by all means. As a teenager, he often went to shooting ranges with his grandfather, and it was his grandfather who encouraged him to join the army. On that fateful day, Seth called his maternal aunt Amanda, his mother's younger sister, and said he was going to visit his grandparents but didn't want to meet his mother there. The woman did not know that Tosha and her husband were visiting her parents, so she assured Seth that he could go without fear of crossing paths with his mother and stepfather. Amanda confirmed that information in court, noting that her nephew couldn't have known that Tosha and James were at Rose's house. Seth had hoped that he and his grandfather would go to the shooting range, and that was the reason he had brought a rifle with so many rounds of ammunition. He drove up to the house, got the gun, and went straight to the trailer where Grandpa usually worked. There, his grandson showed him his rifle, and they had a little discussion about it. Curtis then headed for the house without letting go of the rifle, and his grandson followed him. Seth knew that his grandfather had a gun and expected him to follow him, and afterward, according to Seth's lawyers, Curtis may have had a temporary insanity during which he killed members of his family. But this version seemed untenable, so it was not considered initially and marked in court although on the clothes and shoes of an elderly man also had traces of blood of the victims, he, for some reason from the very beginning, was not even included in the number of suspects. The young man in the dock was facing the capital punishment of death for the premeditated triple murder of his family members. His grandfather had been a key witness in the case from the beginning, and despite the fact that he had openly stated that he was prepared to kill his grandson that day, the court found such behavior justified. Curtis Rose was not taken to the station or questioned as a suspect, and his version of the events of that day was accepted as the only true one. In addition, many details and inconsistencies were simply overlooked, and Seth's version was not even considered until a year and a half after the crime. Most of the physical evidence did confirm Curtis's words, but what was out of the picture was somehow ignored by the investigation. The main argument in court was that Mr. Rose had no obvious motive for killing his wife, daughter, and son-in-law. The version of temporary insanity seemed far-fetched and untenable. The trial lasted more than a week, during which time nearly 200 pieces of evidence were presented and dozens of witnesses, including neighbors, relatives, and family friends, were heard. The grandfather and grandson's testimony completely contradicted each other and it was obvious that one of them was lying. The jury deliberated for several days. They admitted to being severely exhausted emotionally and physically, but when it came to a verdict, they unanimously stated that they had no doubt that the defendant was guilty of each of the counts charged. Thus, Seth Denton was found guilty of triple murder, but after a detailed review of all the evidence and circumstances of the tragedy, the court decided to exclude the death penalty from the possible punishments, changing the sentence to life imprisonment. A horrific crime in an upscale London neighborhood. Compulsive thoughts are a mental disorder characterized by the occurrence of ideas and actions that occur against a person's will and from which they cannot free themselves. In some severe cases, 
These thoughts can literally take over the mind, and when combined with a complex manipulative nature, innate cruelty, and a manic desire for dominance, it creates a time bomb. British Sabrina Quieter had every chance of achieving the fabulous, rich, and carefree life she dreamed of from an early age, but it was never enough for her. No partner was good enough for her, and she constantly felt like she was born for fame, attention, and luxury. Her unrealized ambitions and obsessive fantasies eventually escalated into delusions with bouts of violence. Unfortunately, Sabrina found a defenseless man on whom she vented all her anger. This case became one of the most heinous and high profile in British history. An innocent girl who cared for her children became the victim of a deranged sadist. Sabrina Kuiter, Early Years. Sabrina Kuiter, born on December 5, 1982, in a London suburb, had a distinctive blend of French and Algerian heritage from her parents. This unique mix likely contributed to her striking appearance and fiery temperament. The eldest of four children, Sabrina was the darling of her family, constantly praised and set as a model for others. At the age of two, her family emigrated to France, settling in Paris, where she spent most of her childhood and youth. Sabrina's complex character began to manifest in her school years. Her former classmates later recalled that she was arrogant, domineering, self-absorbed, and extremely selfish. She had few friends, either at school or among her neighborhood peers, considering everyone around her unworthy of her time. To other bright, outgoing girls, she was particularly hostile, viewing them as competitors and enemies. With her stunning looks, a striking brunette with brown eyes and an impressive figure, Sabrina could have pursued a career in modeling if she had the ability to connect with others rather than just seeking to manipulate them. As a child, she was active in sports, and showed some interest in music during her youth. But her inconsistency, impatience for quick results, and lack of effort hindered her success in any field. Years later, Sabrina claimed she experienced harsh treatment from her maternal relatives in France during her early years. However, these claims were never substantiated or proven. Contrarily, her family insisted that she was indulged and always sought attention. As a teenager, while active in sports, Sabrina suffered a back injury, leading to a dependence on prescription painkillers. She tried to obtain these drugs illegally, leading to her arrest and a police warning. Sabrina was always intensely focused on herself and her appearance, craving constant attention. She had no doubt that her future held a wealthy, glamorous life filled with celebrity interactions and her own stardom. Sometimes it seemed her fantasies clouded her reality as she believed her rightful place was in Hollywood. Sabrina graduated from the Sorbonne with a degree in English and French literature. However, since 2006, she claimed various fashion industry professions such as stylist, makeup artist, fashion designer, or designer, though she lacked real expertise in these areas. Complex relationship with Wissem Maduni, Sabrina Quiter, known for her stunning looks, had a penchant for captivating men and exploiting their affection, but she never saw any of her suitors as worthy of a serious relationship. She was literally waiting for a prince who would completely obey her. After finishing school, Sabrina was still unclear about her life goals, feeling entitled to everything without effort. Nevertheless, she enrolled at the prestigious Sorbonne University and simultaneously worked at a sweet shop for financial support. It was there, at the age of 18, that she met Wissem Maduni. Maduni, six years her senior, was a manager at a major French company's head office and studied at one of Paris's most prestigious universities. He aspired to a master's degree for career advancement. Despite not being particularly handsome, part of elite clubs, or in the celebrity circle, he fell deeply in love with Sabrina and was willing to fulfill all her whims and fancies. Sabrina, too, found Maduni appealing, seeing him as someone she could manipulate yet also as a ticket to a wealthy life. He was ambitious and capable of great career success and was ready to pamper and spoil her. The couple began dating in 2000 and within a few months decided to move in together. Sabrina quickly revealed her true nature, striving to control Maduni in every aspect. If her demands were not met, she resorted to tantrums, manipulations, and even physical violence. Moreover, she soon started openly cheating on Maduni, not bothering to hide it or justify her actions. 
She could engage in flings with anyone, from a random acquaintance to Maduni's best friend or colleague. Despite several attempts to end the relationship and leaving her, Maduni always returned, unable to break free from his deep love for Sabrina. In 2001, Maduni achieved his master's degree and a significant promotion. He began earning a substantial income, which he spent lavishly on Sabrina's luxurious clothing and entertainment. His family owned several properties in Paris and he managed them, giving all the rental income to Sabrina. Maduni, who also had Franco-Algerian roots, saw a kindred spirit in Sabrina. According to some reports, in the fall of 2001, the couple married in a special Muslim ceremony evidenced by a certificate issued by the Argentoy Mosque. However, this religious ceremony was insufficient to make the union official and legal. The couple had a son, whose paternity Maduni officially recognized. However, years later, a Frenchman named Anthony Francois claimed he was the child's father. Francois, a witness in Queter's trial, described her as volatile, unpredictable, promiscuous, and manipulative. Relocation to London In 2008, the global financial crisis hit hard, leading to the bankruptcy of the company where Wissem Maduni worked, resulting in the loss of his high-paying job. It was around this time that Sabrina Queter developed a fixation on moving to London. She made the move without much consultation with her partner, left with little choice and hoping for a new career start in one of the world's major financial hubs, Maduni followed her to London. Once in London, Maduni found employment in a major English bank. However, Sabrina struggled to find her footing in the fashion industry. Her aspirations to become a designer, model, or makeup artist were hindered by a lack of skills, experience, and formal education in these fields. Consequently, she had to lower her expectations. Over time, she worked in various capacities, including as a nanny, in a call center, a cafe, and even tried her hand at network marketing. Romance with Mark Walton Sabrina Kuider's quest for love took a turn when she rekindled her teenage passion for music, adding the titles of musician and composer to her resume. Despite her enthusiasm, Sabrina struggled to find professional opportunities in the music industry. She attended numerous auditions and social events, hoping to make valuable connections. At one of these events, Sabrina fortuitously met Mark Walton, a renowned musician, songwriter, and one of the founding members of the famous Irish boy band, Boyzone. After leaving the group, Mark became a successful producer and music mogul, collaborating with artists like Jennifer Lopez, Jessica Simpson, and Lady Gaga. By 2016, his net worth had exceeded a billion dollars. Mark was precisely the kind of person Sabrina had dreamt of meeting, her ticket to a world of fame and luxury. She managed to impress Mark with her beauty and charisma. He was captivated by her and openly admitted falling in love at first sight, unable to think of anyone but the stunning woman. Their relationship progressed rapidly and Sabrina made efforts to remain pleasant and endearing, quickly ending her relationship with Maduni as she saw a promising future with Mark. His previous relationship and child were no deterrent for her. Within weeks, the lovers moved in together residing in a luxurious house in an upscale area of London. Mark took on all the expenses, including the rent for the lavish house chosen by Sabrina. For several months, Sabrina lived the opulent life she had long aspired to, socializing with celebrities, attending elite events, wearing couture clothing, and even appearing in glossy magazines. However, managing Mark proved challenging for Sabrina, as she feared losing him. She couldn't control her nature for long and soon began to show jealousy towards every woman around Mark. Sabrina's demands increased over time, seeking more gifts and luxury. Mark indulged her with designer clothes, jewelry, and outings to high-end restaurants and clubs, but it was never enough for her. The couple's home had a high turnover of staff and nannies, as Sabrina's paranoia led her to believe they were either stealing or attempting to seduce Mark. Her irrational behavior eventually drove Mark to his breaking point. In 2011, he ended the relationship and left for California, leaving Sabrina with nothing. Losing Mark also meant losing the lavish lifestyle she had enjoyed. Sabrina started giving interviews, accusing Mark of cruelty, violence, and substance abuse. 
She called him, crying, begging him to return and even threatened to take her own life. But none of these tactics brought him back. Who is the father of the second child? After realizing she had lost Mark Walton, Sabrina Kuiter reached out to her ex-partner, Wissem Maduni. Maduni, whose career was flourishing as a bank executive, immediately forgave and accepted her back, still harboring feelings for her. They resumed living together. Shortly after reuniting with Maduni, Sabrina discovered she was pregnant. She quickly informed Walton, who, through his lawyers, expressed willingness to provide for the child and Sabrina, offering a monthly allowance. However, Walton insisted on a paternity test post-delivery to confirm his fatherhood. Sabrina's refusal to undergo the test, which could have secured her substantial regular payments, hinted at her uncertainty about the child's paternity. Instead of agreeing to the test, she demanded Walton double the proposed allowance. Upon his refusal, she declared war on the musician. Sabrina took to social media, spreading false claims that Walton was obsessed with her, insanely jealous of Maduni, and was physically threatening them. She accused Walton of breaking into their home, assaulting Maduni, scaring the children, and sexually assaulting her in unnatural ways. However, she couldn't substantiate her claims as Walton had a solid alibi, being in the United States since their breakup. After Walton filed a defamation lawsuit and the police threatened action against her, Sabrina temporarily ceased her accusations against the ex-boyfriend. She settled in Wimbledon, southwest London, with Maduni and their two children, leading a seemingly quiet life as the conflict appeared to be resolved. French nanny Sabrina Queter, unaccustomed to managing household chores and finding it challenging to handle two children, decided to hire a nanny who could also assist with housework. She posted a job advertisement online and personally conducted interviews. Most candidates did not meet her expectations, and those who did, did not stay long in her household. A young French woman named Sophie Lyonnais responded to the advertisement. At the time, 19-year-old Sophie was in her provincial hometown in France, so the interview was conducted via video call. This modest, unassuming provincial agreed to all terms, child care, household help, and cooking for a symbolic weekly pay of 50 British pounds, including full board and lodging with the employer. Sophie was born on January 7, 1996, in the small town of Troy, situated between Auxerre and Sens. Her parents, Catherine and Patrick Lyonnais, were simple workers, leading a modest, if not poor, lifestyle. After finishing school, Sophie obtained a diploma in childcare but did not wish to work in her province, aspiring instead to move to a big city. Known for being shy, quiet, and plain in appearance, but very kind and open-hearted, Sophie was loved by those who knew her. Due to poor vision, she wore glasses, which she was somewhat self-conscious about. During their conversation, Coeter realized that Sophie, the plain Jane, would be an ideal target for her manipulations. Moreover, Sophie was eager to gain experience and good references, thus willing to work for minimal wages. To Sophie, Sabrina seemed like a serious and reliable employer, a fact she shared with her parents before departing for London. As kind employers turned into sophisticated sadists, Initially, things seemed to go well for Sophie Leonette, who naively believed that working for the Queeters would be an excellent start to her nanny career. She quickly bonded with the children, managed household chores as per her contract, and had enough time and resources to improve her English and explore city attractions. This peaceful period lasted several months and all seemed well. Problems began when Maduni lost his job and the family's only stable income became the monthly child support payments from Walton. Sabrina again demanded increased payments from Walton, who in turn requested a DNA test to confirm his paternity. The family faced serious financial issues, struggling with expensive rent and basic living expenses. Sabrina, unwilling to cut back on her luxuries and desperate to maintain her socialite lifestyle, became irritable and aggressive, often taking out her anger on the young nanny. The couple attempted to start a bakery business with their last funds, but it failed. Sabrina then turned to Walton, asking for a substantial amount of money to launch her clothing line, only to be met with a categorical refusal, leading to tears and complaints about poverty. 
Sabrina frequently complained to Lionet about her ex-lover, and the nanny tried to console her employer. What happened next varies depending on the source. According to one version, Huiter conceived a plan to use Sophie as a weapon for blackmailing Walton. She intended to portray Sophie as Walton's accomplice and lover, supposedly planted in their home to disrupt their lives and endanger the children. Sabrina claimed that the provincial fool was in love with Walton, who used her as a tool for revenge. She believed that recording the nanny's confessions on tape or video and presenting them to the police would be sufficient evidence to demand compensation from Walton for his heinous act. However, Sophie refused to give false statements on camera. Another version, as argued by Queter's lawyers in court, suggested that due to her mental disorder, Sabrina genuinely believed in her conspiracy theory and saw Sophie as an enemy and a threat to her family. She allegedly didn't force the nanny to give false testimony, but truly believed Sophie was Walton's accomplice, infiltrated into their household to harm them. Regardless of the truth, Sophie's life soon turned into a living nightmare. Torture chamber in the basement of a wealthy home. Initially, Young Frenchwoman Sophie Lyonnais was burdened with extra work without a corresponding increase in her meager salary. Eventually, she was engaged in endless chores from dawn till late night, with no personal time and effectively imprisoned within the house walls. Sophie's pay was soon halted entirely, and to prevent her escape or return to France, her employers confiscated her passport, making her a captive. Her communication with family was strictly monitored. The situation worsened. Sophie was barely fed and constantly pressured to give false statements against Walton, whom she had never met or known. She was communicated with solely through screams, insults, and threats. Accused of stealing money and valuables, she was threatened with imprisonment if she failed to comply with their demands against the musician. When screaming and blackmail proved ineffective, the cooters resorted to more brutal and sophisticated methods. Sophie was effectively relocated to a cold basement where she spent all her time when not working. Fed scantily once or twice a day, she became emaciated and weak. However, the cold and hunger were not the worst she endured. Physical abuse became the most torturous stage. It started with slaps and hair pulling, but escalated when Sabrina broke Sophie's nose in a violent assault. The sight of blood seemingly unleashed Sabrina's fury, turning beatings into a daily ordeal for Sophie. Each day brought new methods of cruelty designed to inflict unbearable pain and suffering. The basement of this wealthy house in an affluent London area turned into a real torture chamber for Lionet, with no hope of rescue. Strange visit to the police station. In late summer 2017, Sabrina Corder brought the unfortunate Sophie Lionet to a police station, claiming that Sophie was ready to testify against Mark Walton, with whom she allegedly had a romantic and criminal relationship and who had supposedly sent her to their house to abuse the children. However, Sophie remained silent, refusing to say what Sabrina demanded. The police decided to speak with Sophie privately and took her to a separate room. Sabrina was furious, fearing that Sophie would reveal the horrors happening at their home and implicate her and her husband. Mysteriously, Sophie chose not to disclose anything or seek help. The police's response was also peculiar. Despite seeing a malnourished, frightened, and weakened young woman, they did not call a doctor or a psychologist to ensure her well-being and safety. At that point, the 21-year-old nanny weighed less than 40 kilograms, had partially lost her hair, was missing a front tooth, and was noticeably limping. Yet none of this raised any concern with the officers, who simply let everyone go home. Disturbing phone call and a funeral pyre. In mid-September, Sophie Lyonnais made her final call to her mother. Sobbing, Sophie confessed to her mother that she wanted to return home but had no money. Catherine, without delving into details, simply told her daughter that she would buy her a ticket and ask her to pack her bags immediately. This was the last time she would hear Sophie's voice. A few days later, on September 20th, 2017, in the evening, the Queter's neighbors called the police. They were alarmed by a fire in the yard not so much by the fire itself, but by the nauseating, sweetly greasy smell emanating from it. A neighbor said he immediately realized it smelled like burning flesh and hair, along with something unidentifiable. 
and the thick smoke that stretched half a block instantly impregnated clothes and skin with this stench. Firefighters and a police car arrived at the scene. The house owners, appearing calm and seemingly unaware of the reason for the emergency services visit, met them. After extinguishing the fire, what looked like a charred human hand was discovered in the ashes. The couple was immediately taken into custody, and severely burnt human remains were extracted from the fire. The gender and age of the deceased were indeterminable, but soon the body was identified as Sophie Leonette's, recognized by the melted metal frame of the glasses embedded in the skull which Sophie always wore. Cause of Death Determining the cause of Sophie Leonette's death was challenging, as her body was almost entirely destroyed by fire. Forensic experts found multiple rib fractures, jaw cracks, and evidence of blunt force trauma on her skull and limbs, indicating she had suffered these injuries while still alive. Additionally, several of her teeth were missing, and her nose was severely damaged. It became clear that Sophie had endured prolonged and brutal beatings, resulting in broken bones and knocked out teeth. However, assessing the state of her internal organs and identifying any penetrating wounds was impossible due to the extent of the fire damage. The discovery of horrific video recordings in the house, showing Sophie being tortured and coerced into confessing collusion with Walton and intent to harm the children, revealed the true sadistic nature of her captors. Sophie was beaten with fists, an iron cord, a golf club, and even subjected to electric shock torture. She also endured humiliations, such as being forced to submerge her head in a toilet until she began to suffocate. According to experts, Sophie likely died from asphyxiation before being burned on the pyre, sparing her from the agony of being alive during the burning. Trial and Sentence Sabrina Kuiter and Wissem Maduni denied guilt and displayed no remorse for their brutal crime. After the murder, Maduni calmly went to a nearby supermarket to buy fire lighter fluid for burning the body and dinner for his family, behaving as if nothing unusual had happened. The first court hearings against the sadistic couple began in March 2018. Sabrina tried to portray herself as a victim, blaming Mark Walton for driving her to a pathological state with his relentless torment. Medical examinations confirmed Sabrina had mental disorders but was not insane and could comprehend her actions. Wissem, physically healthy, was psychologically dependent on Sabrina, dominated and blindly obedient to her. A former lover of Sabrina, testifying in court, described her as a cunning manipulator, not a mad woman, as she calculated her moves too shrewdly. Another witness stated she always fabricated enemies, but did so rationally, with selfish motives. On June 26, 2018, the court found the couple guilty of torturing, humiliating, and murdering their nanny under aggravating circumstances. They were sentenced to life imprisonment, eligible for parole only after 30 years. Neither admitted guilt, continuously appealing to mitigate their sentences. Sabrina attempted to feign insanity, hoping to move from prison to a hospital, but was unsuccessful. Mark Walton, present at the trial, expressed guilt over his ex-lover's actions as she committed these atrocities to gain his attention and financial compensation. He offered his deepest condolences to the victim's parents and voluntarily issued a substantial check to support the grief-stricken family who lost their beloved daughter. The Case of Matthew Winkler Secrets of a Religious Family Sometimes the most horrible and unpredictable crimes are committed in seemingly perfect families. Of course, even in the most prosperous unit of society can come crisis, which will be unnoticed by others, but literally poison the lives of all members of the family and eventually lead to tragedy. The Winklers, in the town of Selmer, were considered by many to be a model family. The young pastor, his wife, and their three daughters looked happy, had everything they needed for a comfortable life, were healthy and successful, but in a quiet pool, as they say. In this case, many questions remained unanswered, because we heard only one version of what happened, and the story itself became the subject of the book Sex and Murder, Secrets of a Pastor. March 22, 2006, the small town of Selmer, Tennessee, shook the terrible news. A 31-year-old pastor named Matthew Winkler was brutally murdered in his own home, and his wife Mary and their three daughters, eight-year-old Patricia, Six-year-old Maria Eliza and one-year-old Brianna disappeared without a trace. 
That day, the preacher of the Church of Christ did not show up for the evening service where he was supposed to attend with his family. This circumstance seemed strange and suspicious because Matthew was always very responsible and could not miss the planned event without informing anyone. None of the family members also answered the phone, which was even more disturbing. Alarmed community members decided to go to the Winkler's residence to find out what had happened and if they needed help. From the outside, the house looked normal, the windows and doors were intact, and nothing suspicious was visible. Inside, there were lights on in several rooms, and they could hear a television playing quite loudly in one of the rooms. It gave the impression that the owners of the house were busy doing their own thing. The front door was locked, but no one answered the knock. Phone calls also went unanswered, and through the curtained windows, it was impossible to see what was going on inside or if anyone was there. However, even though the whole situation was quite strange, no one was in a hurry to call the police. Instead, a call was made to an elder of the religious community who advised them to look for a spare key and open the door themselves. It took another hour and a half, and when members of the community were finally able to get inside the house, they found an eerie scene. Everything in the house was in its place. There was no sign of intruders, but the owners were nowhere to be seen either. Everything seemed normal until the visitors looked into the marital bedroom. There on the floor, in a pool of his own blood, lay the pastor's body. There was a huge hole in his back from a gunshot wound. Blood spattered everywhere, and bloody foam dried on his face. By then, the body had already cooled and stiffened. It was obvious that Matthew had been lying there for many hours, and had probably been killed in the morning, because he was dressed in his pajamas. It was only after this that a call was made to the police. By the time the police arrived, a whole crowd of neighbors, churchgoers, and casual passers-by had gathered in and around the house, interested in what was going on. All of these people had left their fingerprints at the crime scene. They left their fingerprints and shoe prints, erased or trampled possible evidence, greatly complicating the work of investigators. The police took the body for forensic examination and found that the pastor was killed by a single shot in the back, fired from a large caliber weapon. He died a few minutes after the wound, from massive blood loss, unable to call for help. It was simply impossible to establish definitively whether there were any strangers in the house at that time, because the people who had arrived before the police arrived had literally destroyed all traces of them. The picture of the crime was quite strange, and those who could shed any light on what happened disappeared. The fate of the wife and daughters of the murdered man remained unknown, the police assumed that the woman and children could have been kidnapped or also killed. By the way, the family minivan Winklers also disappeared from the garage. A massive search was launched and the state issued a yellow alert. This meant that children were missing and all citizens were asked to be vigilant and assist in the search. But let's break this whole story down from the beginning. Matthew Brian Winkler was born in 1974, November 21st in the picturesque country town of Henderson, Tennessee, and was the youngest of three sons of Dan and Diane Winkler. Our hero and his two older brothers, James and Daniel, grew up in a rather conservative Christian family. Their parents were very religious and brought up their sons in strictness and obedience. It is worth noting that Matthew became a minister of the church in the fifth generation. His father, great uncle Michael, grandfather Wendell, great grandfather Merlin Winkler, and great-great-grandfather Merlin Paul Winkler Sr. were all preachers of the gospel at one time. The father, to top it all off, ran the local preacher's school and was a man respected and influential in his hometown. In their younger years, the Winkler brothers attended Sunday school and were active in church activities. In addition, Matthew in high school was seriously interested in soccer, and everyone who saw his game on the field noted that he had talent and he could well become an outstanding athlete of world renown. However, later the young man decided to sacrifice a promising sports career in favor of Bible study and church ministry. Since the preaching activity of the head of the family was associated with frequent travel, his wife and children almost always followed him. Because of this, Matthew changed several schools in his childhood, but the active, communicative, and friendly child quickly made friends and gained authority everywhere. When the boy finished school, 
His family lived in a small city called Austin, located in the state of Texas. Matthew was a creative person, had a powerful charisma, but here are some outstanding achievements and studies could not boast. After graduating from high school, he entered the college Fry at Hardeman and successfully completed it. In parallel, the young man began to try his hand as a pastor under the careful guidance of his father. Matthew was the youth minister of the Central Church of Christ in the city of McMinnville. He was later appointed to the preaching position at the Fourth Street Church of Christ in Selmer, Tennessee. Mary Carol Winkler, maiden name Freeman, was born in December 1973 in Geist Township, Tennessee, and was the oldest of two daughters to her parents. She was also raised in a deeply religious family with strict rules. The head of the family for many years served as a pastor in the Christian church where the girl attended Sunday school. A few years later, a second daughter was born to the family and named Patricia. Unfortunately, the girl was born prematurely and had a number of serious health problems, including cerebral palsy, encephalitis, epilepsy, and mental retardation. For many years, the parents did not want to put up with the disappointing diagnoses of the child and desperately tried to treat her, agreeing even to experimental therapy. However, it did not bring any particular improvement. Mary tenderly loved her little sister, always treated her with awe and cared for her as best she could. But in 1987, when 10-year-old Patricia was bathing in the bathtub, her older sister was only a minute away to take something from the bathing accessories, and at that very moment, the girl had another epileptic seizure. When Mary returned to the room, her sister was no longer breathing, and all attempts to resuscitate her had come to nothing. For a 13-year-old girl, it was a huge shock and the first loss in her life. She blamed herself for the tragedy and was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Teachers who saw the deplorable state of Mary sent her to the school psychologist, working with whom she helped. But her father, learning about what was happening, made a scandal and forbade his daughter to go to these sessions, saying that such problems are discussed only within the family. In fact, the girl never received real moral support from her parents. Mary grew up modest and quite charlay. She tried to avoid any conflicts, and after the tragic death of her little sister, she became withdrawn. Since her father did not allow her to seek help from a specialist, the trauma over the years has resulted in serious psychological problems. After the death of Patricia, the parents decided to adopt a little girl named Charlotte, who was from a dysfunctional large family Soon, the couple was also allowed to take custody of Charlotte's two brothers and sister, so the family was reunited in their new home. Mary was once again the older sister and took care of the younger children while helping her mother. Matthew and Mary Winkler, family life. The future spouses met soon after Matthew graduated from high school. The guy was prominent, handsome, athletic, and enjoyed great popularity with the opposite sex, but to spin novels right and left he did not allow a strict religious upbringing. The young people immediately developed a liking for each other, which quickly grew into love. For both of them, it was the first strong feeling in their lives, and after a couple of months, they met each other's parents, and having received their blessing, began to plan a wedding. In April 1994, the lovers got married. When the family had an older daughter, Patricia, the head of the family was still in college and was forced to leave school for a while. He took a job at a construction site, but long there did not last, because he was not used to hard physical labor. During this period, for the first time, made himself aware of the difficult character of Matthew. He was often angry with others, irritated at small things, and sometimes he could not control his anger. But Mary tried not to complain, and not to tell anyone about what was happening in her family. A meek young woman, brought up in the spirit of patriarchy, obeyed her husband in everything. At first, the Winklers lived near the house of Mary's parents, so she was able to see them regularly. But soon Mrs. Freeman was diagnosed with cancer, which rapidly progressed, and in just a few months she literally burned from the disease. It was another shock for Mary, and the care of her underage siblings now fell on her shoulders. The situation was further complicated by the fact that Mary was pregnant again at that time. But soon after the birth of their second daughter, the family moved to another city, where they bought their own small house. After the move, Mary was completely absorbed in the care of the baby, and almost stopped communicating with her father, 
as well as with younger brothers and sisters who were too demanding and constantly needed attention. In addition, the young mother began to suffer from severe postpartum depression. Everyone who was closely acquainted with the family Winkler noted some oddities in the character and behavior of Mary. The young woman was characterized as an introvert and even sociophobic. She did not communicate with anyone. It was difficult for her to make new acquaintances, much less friendships. She suffered from mood swings, was prone to melancholy, and any little thing could bring her to tears. While Matthew was building his career as a pastor, his wife became increasingly withdrawn. The situation became even more complicated when Mary once again became pregnant, and a few months later, she learned that the fetus had died in her womb. Such news strongly shook Mary, who was looking forward to the appearance of this child and very much dreamed of a large, friendly family. Again, to see the long-awaited two stripes on the pregnancy test she could only two years later, and her happiness was unbounded. This time, Mary hid her pregnancy for a long time, as if afraid of something. She did so until her situation became obvious. Once again, everyone began to talk about Mary's strange behavior and pathological reticence. The strange behavior of Mrs. Winkler was associated not only with the severe psychological trauma she suffered in childhood, but also with a very unhealthy environment within her own family, which only undermined her already unstable nervous system. The head of the family was a man of authority and demanded unconditional obedience. Despite the fact that in public the Winklers looked like an ideal married couple, where there was trust, mutual respect and harmony, in reality, their neighbors have repeatedly heard how the husband shouted and snapped at his wife for no apparent reason. No one could even imagine that a respected pastor could raise a hand on his wife until one day Mary had a huge black eye. Despite the fact that she denied the fact of domestic violence and said that it was an accident, the city quickly spread rumors about the cruelty of a young creature who beats the mother of his children. In addition, Matthew at some point developed an irresistible urge to experiment in bed. He offered his wife to diversify their intimate life with role-playing games, adult toys, and so on. But for Mary, brought up in strictness with conservative views, such was unacceptable. She strongly restricted her husband in this, which infuriated him, and he repeatedly tried to get what he wanted by force. One day, after another abuse in bed, Mary called her only close friend in tears and complained to her about the situation. The friend, who promised to keep her secret, immediately blabbed about everything, which provoked a new wave of rumors and gossip about the unacceptable behavior of the clergyman. At that time, Matthew was up for promotion and aspired to be a local church leader, but he was rejected because of rapidly spreading unpleasant rumors about him. Moreover, he was also removed from his position in the Sunday school, where he had brought God's word to the children and was in good standing. This was requested by the parents, who had also heard about the pastor's peculiar predilections. All this forced the family to leave their residence and move to another city where they planned to start over. They settled in Silmer, where they quickly gained the love and respect of those around them. Matthew took a job as a church pastor again, and his wife found a part-time job to make a small contribution to the family income. And although the family was still not smooth, their neighbors, as well as the congregation of the church where Matthew preached, considered Mary and Matthew an ideal couple, and their family a model. Next door to the Winkler family lived a young married couple, with whom the couple quickly became friends. They often visited each other, celebrated holidays together, shared news and secrets. A few months before the tragedy, during a joint dinner at the pastor's house, Mary bragged to the neighbors that her husband had bought her a gun for self-defense and had already taken her to the shooting range several times to learn how to handle it confidently. Mary turned out to be quite a capable student, quickly mastered all the subtleties, and accurately shot at targets. Moreover, it turned out that the Winklers already had firearms in the house, which had been purchased by the pastor earlier, also for self-defense. The guests wondered why the pastor and his wife needed all this, because they live in a quiet town where they have no enemies and everyone around them loves and respects their family. After another move of the couple, their financial situation left much to be desired. Mary was in search of various part-time jobs, and she also decided to get a medical degree to then get a job in a clinic and help sick children. 
Soon, Mary decided to improve the financial condition of their family through financial fraud. She herself later claimed that she did not realize that she was doing something illegal and was going to pay back all the money as soon as she got back on her feet. What Mary was doing is commonly referred to as artificially inflating account balances. Mrs. Winkler also received checks from unspecified sources and then deposited them into a bank account she and her husband owned. She then changed the address of the account so that all communications would be routed there. The total amount of checks she received was almost $17,000, which aroused certain suspicions of the bank employees who decided to invite the couple to the office branch to clarify the circumstances and resolve the situation. But the pastor and his wife never showed up at the bank, and this aroused even more suspicion. It was assumed that Matthew was not aware of what his wife was doing at all. However, after Matthew's death, his wife tried to prove in court that the whole story of fraud was his idea, and that it was he who forced her to make dubious transactions, while he himself remained in the shadows, without arousing suspicion. Where has Mary disappeared to? When Mr. Winkler was found murdered in his own home, his wife and daughters were put on the wanted list, fearing that they too might be in mortal danger. Initially, the meek, shy, and homely Mary was initially viewed solely as a possible victim of the crime. However, after talking to neighbors and receiving information from the bank about financial fraud, she became the main suspect in the murder of her own husband. It was necessary to find out as soon as possible where Mary had disappeared to, where the children were, and if they were all right. They, as well as their family car, were put on the wanted list. Attempts were also made to trace transactions made for Mary's bank card and to locate her location through her cell phone signal. Mary was found just a day later in an Alabama resort town where she and her children were having fun at a local amusement park. It was as if the mother wanted to give her children one last party, realizing that she would soon be going to prison and would see her girls very soon. When the family was taken to the police station to testify, the two older daughters confidently told the same story. According to them, intruders broke into the house and injured their dad and their mom picked up a gun to protect them. They were then forced to run for their lives. According to the girls, their father was alive and in the hospital and they were soon to go and see him and return home. What exactly happened in the house as it turned out, Patricia and Maria Eliza did not see and learned about the events from the words of their mother. They only heard a gunshot and glimpsed their father lying on the floor, and then their mother put them in the car, and they drove away. Mary almost immediately began to confess, but she claimed that she could not reconstruct the entire chain of events of that day, referring to the temporary blur. According to her, her spouse had abused her for years, humiliating her and inducing her to forms of intimacy that were unacceptable to her. Mary insisted that it was he who had initiated the financial scam she had perpetrated. Matthew demanded total obedience, easily lost his temper, and once gave the will of his fists. This was confirmed by Matthew's secretary at his previous place of employment. The woman repeatedly witnessed how the pastor insulted his wife, who carefully brought him lunch to church, but he was always dissatisfied with something. The evening before the tragedy, there was another scandal in the family because of which the spouses went to bed in separate rooms. Mary cried all night, and in the morning she did not realize how in her hands was a shotgun which her husband kept loaded. She entered Matthew's room and shot him in the back while he was still lying in bed. Matthew collapsed to the floor, bloody foam oozing from his mouth and nose. According to Mary, her husband, while still alive, whispered, Why? To which he replied, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Mary then took her daughters and left the house, and her husband, as experts have established, tried to reach for the phone to call for help, but he no longer had the strength to do so. By the way, the weapon of crime was found in the trunk of the car on which Mary left with the children. For what purpose she took it with her, Mrs. Winkler also could not answer. At the trial, the role-playing costumes found in their home were presented as evidence of the pastor's humiliation and moral abuse of his wife. Upon seeing them, Mary turned pale and then became hysterical. Despite the fact that she confused her testimony and told several different versions of what happened, the court agreed that she was the victim of a domestic tyrant 
and the murder was the result of years of anger, resentment, and pain. However, this did not absolve Mary of responsibility for what she had done. In April 2007, the court delivered its final verdict in this complicated and confusing case. Mrs. Winkler was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter, but her mental state raised many questions. It was originally expected that the young woman would be sent to prison for at least six years, but in the end, she was given a sentence of less than one year. She spent two months of that sentence in a psychiatric hospital where experts were trying to determine whether she could regain custody of her children upon release. In the summer of 2008, Mary was given sole custody of her daughters, who all this time lived with their paternal grandparents. Matthew's parents were extremely upset by this circumstance. They believed that their daughter-in-law had deliberately killed their son and suffered virtually no punishment for it, and now their granddaughters were given full custody of her. However, all their numerous attempts to file appeals had failed. As for the fraud case, it never went to trial. The bank never filed formal charges, and the whole story was dropped. The story of a British woman named Dina Thompson, nicknamed the Black Widow, became, in the mid-twenties, one of the main topics for numerous documentaries, TV shows, and crime programs. This pleasant at first glance woman turned out to be a pathological liar, fraudster, and led to the grave, at least one man who loved her wholeheartedly. Dina repeatedly managed to escape punishment, but in 2003, she was still in the dock. Despite the fact that she was facing life imprisonment, the court was surprisingly mild, allowing parole. So in 2022, one of the most dangerous criminals who miraculously survived her ex-husband characterized as pure evil, went free. Thompson's victims were always men, which according to experts, may indicate some kind of trauma received by the criminal in childhood or adolescence. However, Dina's early years were quite prosperous. The girl was born in 1960 in North London and brought up in a full family. Her parents lived modestly, but did everything to ensure that their daughter did not need anything. The head of the family worked as a prison guard, seriously engaged in sports, and from childhood, motivated Dina to attend gyms, where she diligently engaged in gymnastics. In addition, the man often participated in all kinds of sports competitions, including those held in other countries, and constantly took his daughter with him. Dina grew up quite active, cheerful, and sociable child. She easily made acquaintances and friendships with peers, and with age learned to quickly win the attention of guys she liked. After school, the girl went to college, and then got a job in one of the local banks. At the age of 22 years, Dina met her future first spouse, Lee Wyatt. They first met thanks to the cousin of the guy, who organized a couple blind date. Between young people immediately burst feelings, and a stormy romance began. They got along well, spent a lot of time together, and two years later officially legalized their relationship. After the wedding, the couple moved to a provincial place called Yapton, with a population of only 3,000 people. Soon the couple had a son, and the new parents began to slowly develop their own business, creating authors' soft toys, the images of which they invented together. In parallel, Dina worked as a cashier in a construction organization, and their family, according to neighbors, was quite happy and prosperous. The head of the family was often away on business matters and was absent from home for long periods of time. With neighbors, the man practically did not communicate, but his wife, on the contrary, quickly made acquaintances with local residents. Dina knew how to win the favor of others, easily rubbed in the trust. In addition, Men often paid attention to the attractive young woman and even tried to court her. At the dawn of the 90 AS, Dina met with a young journalist, whose name was Julian Webb. The man offered her to work as a model for advertising clothing and household appliances, and soon her pictures were painted on the pages of local newspapers and magazines. Dina was eager to pose and felt at ease in front of the camera. By then, Lee Wyatt hadn't been home for months and none of the neighbors had any idea where he was or why he'd been gone so long. His wife, apparently, did not miss him too much, having had an affair with Julian. Just three months after meeting, the journalist introduced the chosen one to his parents, saying that he was going to marry her. Subsequently, Webb's mother recalled that she was quite surprised by such a hasty decision of her son. In addition, a potential daughter-in-law, 
who was a few years older than Julian, did not inspire her confidence. When the neighbors learned about the upcoming wedding, they were puzzled because they knew that Dina is already legally married to another man. However, her husband hadn't been home for months and no one knew for sure where he was or what was wrong with him. As it later turned out, all this time, Lee was in the small town of New Key, located almost on the other side of the country. There he lived under an assumed name and false documents, hiding, as he thought, from the Mafia. In fact, the man became a victim of skillful lies of his wife, who convinced him that their family was in mortal danger and escape. This is the only way out. The couple, as mentioned, were engaged in creating authors' soft toys, and their most successful creation was Leprechaun Sean, which sold well and gained a certain popularity. In early 1991, Dinah told her husband that their creation was interested in the corporation Disney and is ready to pay 50 million pounds sterling for the opportunity to use this character. But the joy was short-lived, and soon the woman reported that representatives of the criminal world, having learned about the big deal, want to get most of the money, threatening otherwise to kill the whole family. Dina also came up with a way out of the situation, convincing her husband that he needed to hide. Lee quickly acquired fake documents and went on the run. But before this cunning woman persuaded Lee to write several threatening letters to her and make several similar records of phone calls, which allegedly were supposed to be proof that he hates his wife, so that the mafia to stop pursuing her. The trusting husband, not suspecting anything, did as his wife told him to do and then fled. In a foreign city with no home or friends, Lee was ready to take on any job, and all the money he earned was sent to his wife and son so that his family did not need anything. Most likely, this escape really saved his life, but the threat came not from fictional bandits, but from his own wife. In November of the same 1991, Dina married her new favorite, Julian, and the wedding couple played on the very money that faithfully sent home deceived Lee. Webb was madly in love and happy, but soon after the wedding neighbors began to notice that the woman regularly visits the lovers while her husband at work. And after a while, she informed Julian that she was terminally ill and was fired from her job because of it. The story with a fatal diagnosis and dismissal turned out to be a lie from the first to the last word. And it also turned out that from the accounts of the company where Dina worked, a large amount of money was missing, and the main suspect in this crime was herself. Then the woman accused her first husband, Lee Wyatt, who allegedly forced her to go to the crime by threats. As evidence, she provided the very letters and audio recordings that she herself had previously convinced him to do. Wyatt himself returned home as soon as he learned that his spouse had remarried. The case was limited to a scandal, and although Dina claimed that he had beaten her, there was no evidence of this. Nevertheless, the detectives sided with the woman, so Lee again had to leave Yapton in a hurry. In love, Julian's situation did not embarrass at all, and he gave his wife all his savings for the treatment of fictitious her fatal disease. But time passed, the money melted, and the husband began to wonder how the treatment is progressing. It turned out that the woman did not have a single medical document confirming her diagnosis. Relationships in the family broke down. Neighbors heard how the spouses fought loudly, and in June 1994, the day after celebrating Julian's 31st birthday, he died suddenly. The evening before the tragedy, his mother called him, but Dina reported that her husband wasn't feeling well and couldn't answer. Julian's mother asked her sister-in-law to call an ambulance, but she ignored her request. The expert examination showed that the young man died of a drug overdose, but for some reason no one saw a criminal trace in this tragedy and his wife insisted that her husband voluntarily decided to kill himself. In addition, she demanded that Julian's body was cremated, but his parents were strongly opposed to this. Also, after the death of her husband, Dina tried to get a large insurance payment, but she was denied because their marriage was recognized as invalid. At the funeral, Dina did not even try to cry or depict grief. On the contrary, she chose a frank outfit and behaved defiantly. Almost immediately afterward, the widowed woman began to spin numerous novels and affairs. She openly brought lovers to her house, not hiding from the neighbors. Only in 1997, Dina filed a divorce from her first legal husband, 
and less than a year later she met Richard Thompson, who immediately managed to charm. Dina, not thinking long, told the new lover that suffers from a serious illness, and she has to live a very short time. Blinded by love, the man said that he would turn the last months of her life into a fairy tale and is ready to spend all his savings for this. Wedding couple played in one of the best hotels in Florida. There they spent their honeymoon and then returned to their native England, settling on its southern coast in the city of Brighton. According to Richard's memories, his wife literally bewitched him with her care and support, and she also skillfully pretended to share all his views and aspirations. He has always dreamed of owning his own boat to professionally engage in fishing, and his wife not only approved this idea, but also offered him to open a company that provides a yacht for rent so that he could not only fish himself, but also to teach it to others. Less than a year after the wedding, during a New Year's Eve celebration, Dina gave her husband a romantic dinner. They took a bath together, and afterward, she said she had prepared a special gift and asked her husband's permission to tie him up. Richard, not suspecting anything wrong, readily agreed. But as soon as he had the ropes on his hands, a blindfold over his eyes, and a gag in his mouth, he was suddenly struck hard on the head with a bat, followed by another. Luckily, Richard not only did not lose consciousness, but managed to free himself quickly. Then Dina grabbed a knife and wounded her husband in the shoulder. Richard knocked the weapon out of his wife's hands, immobilized her, and called the police. Dina burst into tears, admitted that all this time she had lied to him and spent all his money. However, already at the station, she pulled herself together and began to claim that it was her husband who attacked her, and she was only defending herself. The story did not end there, and a day later, a real estate agent came to Richard's house to sell the house. He had an appointment with the landlady, who warned him that her husband had left for America on a business trip. At that moment, Richard realized that his wife was planning to kill him, sell the house, and run away with the money. No one would look for Thompson himself for a long time, thinking that he had gone across the ocean. In the course of court proceedings, it turned out that the woman had withdrawn all the money from her husband's bank accounts, forging his signature and also used his credit cards, accumulating a lot of debts. The case gained a wide resonance, and other men began to apply to the police, former lovers of Dina, whom she deceived and cleaned to the thread, telling about a fictitious, incurable disease. Then also remembered, and the first husband of the woman who had to hide for many years, first from her fictitious pursuers from the mafia, and then from the police. It was finally revealed that it was Dina who stole the company in which she worked, accusing her husband of everything. However, the jury, despite the presence of irrefutable evidence, acquitted the woman in the case of the attack on her husband, Richard Thompson, and Richard himself was accused of seeking to attract attention to himself, making up such a story. Nevertheless, Dina was found guilty of numerous financial frauds and sentenced to nearly four years in prison. The hype around Dina Thompson also reminded about the strange, sudden death of her second husband, journalist Julian Webb. The woman herself told completely different versions and circumstances of his death. She said that her husband was poisoned by steroids, which he took to keep himself in shape, then claimed that he drank a lot and fell asleep in the sun, getting sunstroke, and at the inquest, and in general, said that he took his own life. Despite her caution, Dina once confessed to her best friend that she had poisoned her husband by putting potent drugs in a spicy dish that he adored. The police managed to track down the owner of the diner where Julian often dined and ordered food to take home. He recalled that the day before the tragedy, Webb's wife took out rice and chicken curry. And then the investigators guessed that it was this seasoning that interrupted the specific flavor of the drugs. In connection with the newly discovered circumstances, a new investigation was initiated, and Julian's body was exhumed and sent for examination. As it turned out, the man was poisoned by a large dose of powerful antidepressants added to his favorite dish with curry, and strengthened their effect aspirin, which Dina dissolved in her husband's drink. At the time of the call to his mother, Webb was still alive, and he could be saved, but it was not part of the plans of his wife. In 2003, the Black Widow was finally brought to trial. The investigator at the hearing characterized her as the most dangerous woman he had ever had to deal with, 
and the judge noted that she was a skilled and very dodgy liar. Dina Thompson was sentenced to life in prison, but with parole eligibility after 16 years. The story of the crimes of the Black Widow formed the basis of numerous documentary detectives actively discussed in TV shows and used in the press. Even after Dina was behind bars, detectives unearthed another dark story from her past. As it turned out, one of her first lovers disappeared without a trace, and to this day has not been found alive or dead. The young man's name was Stoyan Kustov, and he lived in Bulgaria, where Dina herself trained as a gymnast in the late 70s. Between them began a romantic relationship, and afterwards, the guy disappeared forever. The investigation does not exclude that Dina is directly related to this case, and Kovstov became one of her first victims, but it was not possible to prove anything. While serving her sentence, Thompson worked with a prison psychologist and underwent rehabilitation courses. Despite her exemplary behavior and the right words about re-education and realization of her mistakes, Dina, according to the detective in charge of her case, does not feel remorse and pangs of conscience, and therefore, can re-offend. Nevertheless, in the summer of 2022, the 61-year-old Black Widow was released from prison. After learning about it, Richard Thompson said that now he will not feel safe because he does not know what to expect from his former spouse. Now, Dina is obliged to report to the police about all her connections and relationships, observe curfew, and report on all financial transactions. She is also forbidden to approach her ex-husbands and lovers affected by her actions. She is forced to wear a special tracking bracelet on her leg that records all her movements. A few months after her release, Thompson was captured by journalists while returning from a store with shopping in a large bag. Curiously, on the ring finger of her right hand was 